Hi, uh, welcome to uh, Building Engineers uh, in the K-12 classroom, uh, Moore County Schools virtual training this year for 2020. Um, this is the section Robotics and Secondary Mathematics. My name is Matthew Purser. I'm a teacher at Union Pines High School, which is in Moore County Schools. Um, hopefully what we'll do today is talk a little bit about a specific use of a specific type of robot in uh, secondary mathematics, one that I've used in my classroom for a couple of years now. And, um, most of the other Math 2 teachers in uh, Union Pines High School have begun using the same activity too. So it's an activity that we've kind of worked on for a couple of years. Um, about three or four teachers have worked on it in, in conjunction with one of our uh, digital integration facilitators at the school. Um, it's hopefully one that you'll find interested in and hopefully be able to use uh, as a framework to kind of build off of in your class too. Uh, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm a secondary mathematics teacher. I'm also certified in general science. Um, I uh, have experience teaching uh, North Carolina Math 1, 2, 3, and 4 now this year. Um, first time for that. Um, so I've, I've had everybody from freshmen all the way to seniors. Um, I've also taught uh, AP Chemistry, um, which was an interesting experience. Um, it, it was a fun thing to do, um, different than what I've been used to. Um, I mostly teach math. Um, I've had uh, five years experience in education. I've been teaching in Moore County that entire time. Um, I was a lateral entry teacher, came in, um, went ahead and did my master's work at the same time, so I got that all knocked out of the way. Um, I actually grew up in Moore County, um, so I teach in the same district that I went to school in. Um, I spent all my school uh, time in Moore County, uh, came up through the Union Pines uh, route, uh, graduated in 2007, so I actually teach at the same school that I, I graduated from, which is interesting. And, and uh, the classroom I actually teach in is the, this is the classroom I, I did geometry in way back in the day. Um, and my geometry teacher is still here too. Um, she's one of our uh, uh, she's one of our specialists that helps uh, with students that are need a little bit extra push to get them through the day. Um, I'm actually a, a noise master teacher uh, fellow. Um, it's a program through state in partnership with uh, TIP in Raleigh and the National Science Foundation. Um, it's a program to try to design uh, designed to try to facilitate master teachers in mathematics in North Carolina specifically. It's a five-year program um, and uh, it's been great so far. We're about a year into it, so got uh, about four more years left on it. Also, just not to do with the classroom, but also I've worked as a football coach and a faculty advisor for the Viking Gaming Club, which was an esports club uh, through Union Pines. Uh, we played several games. We played League of Legends, Overwatch, um, the Rocket League. Um, we actually had teams uh, at our school that competed with other schools um, and in our Overwatch group, uh, they finished fairly well most of the years, um, placing in the top five out of about 35 schools. So I, I, I have some experience in, in nerdy adventures such as robotics and, and video games, um, which brings us to the activity. So the I do want to say this, that there are an unlimited amount of activities that can be done with robotics in the classroom. I, I don't want this to seem like this is a limitation, that this is the only way to do it, because there are so many options out there for not only for different types of robots, but different ways to use each of those robots. Um, it's, it's really, this is just the absolute tip of the iceberg of what can be done. I, I just want this to be kind of an example of like, here's what I've done, um, and, and maybe give you some ideas to kind of run with and use this as a foundation. Um, but we're going to focus on one example in this one that I've used. Um, it's it's the, the end goal of the, this, this activity is to play the game Battleship, essentially. Um, so what we're going to use for that is Sphero robots. So if you've never used a Sphero robot, they look like this. Um, it's literally a sphere. Um, this is the bolt. Yeah, this is the bolt. So this is the newer model. I started with the Sparks, which are the older model. Um, the bolts are a lot... Uh, nicer, they're a lot more accurate, which is nice. Um, but the the sparks are great too. They work for what we need. Um, they're pretty accurate, considering you know the distances that we're going over. You know, if you're talking about feet, they do pretty well. If you're talking about inches, maybe not so much. But um, they're pretty accurate for what we need. So essentially, the goal of this is to play the game Battleship. Um, and so the Sphero is the torpedo. Um, we use the tiled floor as the grid. I'm lucky enough to be in a room that the tiles are a foot. We've measured them, um, so that's good. So we can just use the floor as like, this is your measurements. And so we don't have to draw it on the floor or we don't have to map out something on the floor. We just use the tiles, um, just kind of draw Sharpie marks where we want the, the points to be. Um, and if you've ever played the game Battleship, we play it the exact same way. So we draw two big grids in the middle of the floor, 
kids are split into two separate teams and uh, they take turns trying to hit each other's ships. Um, it's a really fun activity that we found uh, that especially um, students that are very tech savvy, uh, they, they live their whole life on computers, they seem to love it. And, and what always seems to happen, what I've noticed is, you know, when we get into these groups and these teams, you know, you got 15 kids on one side, 15 kids on the other side, there always seems to be after, after you know, a couple of hours of working on it, because it's a multi-day activity, um, there's always a handful of kids that typically are not the ones that share the most. They're not the ones that volunteer answers. They're typically the ones that are always on their Chromebooks or always on their cell phones or always playing games or doing something. They end up being the go-to kids for these activities because this is their time to shine. They're, they're used to doing this. And most of them have experience with coding, um, which makes this a little bit easier for them too. Um, this is a multi, the way we implemented it is a multi-day activity. We kind of start and scaffold them up from the beginning. You know, they, they get a day to kind of play with the robots and do whatever they want um, within reason. Um, but, you know, just figure it out, figure out how to use this thing. Um, and also we use that time to troubleshoot because generally the first day there's a lot of issues with trying to get robots to connect and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, the kids, have, they, they got the Bluetooth turned off. We got to figure that out and all that kind of stuff. So it takes a, a day to kind of get everybody accustomed to what we're doing. And, and it gives students a time to, you know, get the, the, the giggles and the plays out of it um, where they can just drive the robot around and play and have fun. Um, and then we work up from that. And, and, and because of that, because we scaffold it that way, it's very, very easy to differentiate to different ability levels or different grade levels. You know, we implemented this in a sophomore level math class and we started in honors, um, but we did end up uh, implementing it in non-honors courses too. And they did pretty well. Um, we kind of had to tone it down a little bit for, for uh, non-honors classes um, just to make it doable and not overwhelming. Um, it, it is an activity that is that is easy to do, but it can get frustrating for students when, you know, they make one small mistake or they don't own the robot right and it ends up not hitting, you know, two or three times in a row and, and then they get discouraged. So um, it is very easy to differentiate and keep the kids engaged and keep them from getting uh, burnt out. And again, just to reiterate, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There are plenty of other activities. And one of the great things about Sphero robots in particular is that when you open up the program on a Chromebook or on your phone, um, there are already pre-built activities in them that you can just open up and play around with um, that you can use. Um, these robots have tons of things in them. All we're using in them right now is just, you know, drive forward, turn, rotate, all that stuff. But they have all sorts of sensors in them. Um, there's ways to take these things and use the accelerometers in them to do projectile motion. There's ways to use, um, it'll measure its own velocity, all this kind of stuff. It, it, there's a lot of cool things in it that it can do. Um, and, and this is just kind of a, a preliminary thing. So what is the purpose of doing this? Why do we want to do this? So the main purpose behind it is we, we really want to get students interested in robotics and programming without intimidating them. Um, you know, for the most part, the kids that are interested in programming and robotics, they're probably already doing this in their own time. I've had several students tell me that they got spheres for Christmas uh, before we ever did the activity. So, so this is, or they have drones. I mean, this is something that, that the students that are already interested in it are probably already doing it. Um, this is trying to get those students that would never think to, to do this, get, to get them thinking like, hey, maybe this is something that I would be interested in doing when I get out of here. Um, and and, and it, the Sphero gives you multiple levels of, of trying to introduce this. Uh, it can start with you know, just block programming, which is mostly what we use, all the way up to JavaScript, if a student knows how to write in that. So there's a wide range of, of ways that you can uh, introduce students to this, this concept of programming. Um, it, re it also reinforces the concepts uh, that we learn in the classroom through applications to a problem. So the idea that for the lesson that we did, we, we did it after we did trig. So the students are comfortable using trig on paper and, and able to solve you know, a trig equation or, or a trig word problem like in a test situation. Um, but this project requires them to use trig to solve it like on the floor. Like we are literally drawing this triangle on the floor. Can you find the angle that this robot needs to drive to make it hit this point? Um, you know, can you use the Pythagorean theorem to find the distance you need to go from this point to this point? Can you then use the distance formula uh, to, to calculate a, a, a speed that this thing needs to go to go from this point to this point? Um, so all of those things are things that we learn in Math 1 and Math 2 and even in middle school, um, you know, when, when it comes to the distance formula and speed. Uh, but, but in terms of like applying it to the real world, that's what we're trying to do. It's, it's trying to get them to use those mathematical tools to solve a, a problem. Um, it, it, we also want them to build up their problem solving skills and develop critical thinking skills. And in, in conjunction with that, also the group mentality idea of this is, 
uh, when they're in these groups, yes, you are individually trying to calculate how to make your robot go from point A to point B, but there's an overarching goal of I want my team to make it go to, to B more often than the other team does. And so they, they end up, we start working in pairs and groups, but it ends up just being one good big clump of 15 kids just trying desperately to beat the other 15 kids, which it's really interesting when they get to, into that competitive mindset against other teams because it builds up their uh, internal uh, cohesion in the groups. They, they really want to do well and they enjoy it. Um, it shows students that math is not just this completely abstract idea that it's just on paper and it's numbers, that, that it, it actually applies to things in the real world too. And um, while the situation of playing Battleship is a construed uh, idea of, you know, it's not a real world application, I guess, in the sense of that, but it, it's a, it's an introduction to that math is a physical thing, that it does apply to the physical world. Um, and then the main thing is just to have fun. I mean, a lot of kids tell me that they can't stand mathematics as their least favorite subject. Even students that make A's, they say it's their least favorite subject, and which makes me sad. I mean, I want them to enjoy it, and math is enjoyable. And I want them to see that, you know, that this is just the beginning, that, that this robot, to make it move, it takes math. But it's not the only thing. To make that computer work, it takes math. To make their phone work, it takes math. And uh, you know, we've we've got to we've got to introduce these students to the concepts of, of mathematics driving the world. Otherwise, we're not going to have a next generation of mathematicians that are going to be able to to solve you know the problem and carry it on. So we've really got to do a better job of getting students interested in math and seeing that math isn't just you know synthetically divide this polynomial by this thing. You know, that's that that it's more than just that. All right, so uh, if we're using a Sphero to do uh, this project or just any project in general, I just want to show you the app here. So this is the app that runs the Sphero robots. Um, you can use this on a Chromebook, anything that uses uh, Chrome as its operating system, and you could also use iOS. You can't use Windows. They don't work on Windows devices. So I'm on a Chromebook right now, so this is what our students in our county would see on their Chromebook. Um, you can also use an iPad to do this. I used an iPad when I was uh, filming some of the sections in, the, uh, in this video. Um, you can also use your phone. Um, whatever your school has, it's, it can run it as long as it uh, isn't a Windows device. So you can see here just real quick, um, you can search uh, pre-made activities. So there's things made by Sphero. There's things made by other users. There's tons of stuff here. Um, and, and, you know, you're not limited to what they create. You can create your own, but there is a, a large number of things in here that you could use yourself or that you could pull from and maybe expand on. And you can sort by the subjects and the grade level also. But we're going to make our own today. So what we're going to do is we're going to come over here and we're going to click Connect Robot. And we're going to find one. It doesn't really matter which one. Uh, I like to take the one that's got the highest signal strength, but they're sitting right next to me, so hopefully they'll connect. All right, so there we go. We're connected. So I've got my Sphero ready to go. And uh, when this happens, he lights up, and, and you can find him pretty easily. Depending on the one that you have, it's going to look differently. Um, the Sparks just have a single light on top that tells you that this is the one you're using. The Bolts have like a little LED display on top that uh, you can show patterns and things on it. Uh, but once we get connected, what we're going to do for this one is we're going to go to Programs, My Programs, and we're just going to create a program. So I've created one already. I'm going to make one. And for this task, we don't need a lot. Um, you know, there's tons of different things that you can use here. There's different motion controls. There's rotations. There's directions. There's speed. Um, you can control the lights and make it do different things with the lights. You can make it play sounds. Now, the Sphere doesn't play the sounds. The computer does. Um, you can put in uh, sensors. You can tell it to like tell me the the uh, acceleration, tell me the velocity, all this kind of stuff. Uh, there's events where you can say like if you get hit by another Sphero, do this. So there's a lot of cool things that you can do with this. Um, but we're going to focus on the basic stuff right now. So what we need this Sphero to do is we need it to rotate and we also need it to roll at a certain speed. So those are the two things that we're going to get. And what we're in right now is block programming. So if you've done anything with like the Lego programming, uh, this is very similar to that, um, where you've got a start block and you've got command blocks that you just pull off the bottom here and attach in. So I want it to start, I want it to spin, and then I want it to roll. Now this is just what we figured out does the best. Um, it just makes the Sphero a little bit more accurate when we do these things, um, but you don't have to do it this way. It can be done any other way. 
Um, but this is the way we figured it out. And the way this works is you've got, you know, when you click on spin, uh, you can tell it an angle um, and you can tell it anything. And this is in degrees, so you can tell it to spin it, you know, whatever degree you want. Let's say we want it to rotate 60 degrees. Um, and this does rotate clockwise and zero is straight ahead, um, which doesn't fit with our unit circle model. But thankfully, we don't do the unit circle anymore until math four. So this method is the way that Sphero does the rotations is more intuitive for most students before they get to the unit circle. Um, and it's going to rotate at 60 degrees for three seconds. I want it to roll at the same degree. And you can control this degree by dragging the arrow or you can click on the number and tell it the degree you want it to go. So let's 60. The speed is arbitrary. So it's just a number. It's the number of bits uh, total. So it's 255, um, which gives you 256 uh, speed settings, 0 to 255. Um, you can control it however you want. We tell the students typically to leave it at 100. If you set this thing to 255, it will move. It will roll real quick in order to get away from them. Uh, we found that the lower the speed, typically, um, the more accurate the robot is. Um, there is an acceleration curve to this. It's fairly quick, but if the students are only going like a foot distance, it does, it, it makes a big difference. Um, so typically the slower you go and, and we tell them, you know, once you set the speed, you want to keep it the same because we're about to find the speed and then roll for three seconds. And if I click start, it'll make the robot do this. It'll rotate 60 degrees over a three second period and then it'll roll at a 60 degree angle at its speed of 100, which whatever 100 is, um, for three seconds. And so that's what it does. So what we do on the first day is we assign the students, uh, they get into groups, uh, groups of two usually, depends on the size of the class, but usually groups of two. And uh, they get paired with a robot. So we go through what we just did and pair it. And we kind of explain to them how the blocks work and how they how to do these blocks and let them play around with it. Um, there's also a drive feature. So if you click on this and they figure this out within like five seconds that you can use the AW and you can hear it rolling around in the background. Uh, you can use these keys to make it drive around. You can also use these keys to change the color of it, and it changes the color on the Sphero. Um, so they spend about 20 minutes just playing with that, making the colors nice and pretty, um, and driving it around like a maniac. Um, but once, and, and we tell them that's okay. We tell them that for the first day, just get it out of your system. Just roll with it, pun intended. And uh, they usually do that, and they usually enjoy it. Also during this time, it allows the teachers to kind of troubleshoot. There's always going to be somebody whose Chromebook doesn't connect. There's always going to be a robot that keeps disconnecting. There's always going to be somebody that's got their Bluetooth turned off and they can't figure out how to turn it back on. So that first day is a good time to get that troubleshooting out of the way and let the students start playing. Now, with an honors group, you can probably go ahead and start telling them, hey, here's what we want you to do. We want you to start making this thing. We want to start getting some distance measurements. Um, and this kind of bleeds over into day two. So. If you're working with an honors group, we, we started this on day one with a regular group. Uh, we started this kind of on day two. And what we want them to do is we want them to just create a program that makes this thing go straight ahead. So I'm going to set it to zero straight ahead at some constant speed. I don't want to change the speed. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to change this, the time measurements because that's what we're allowed to control. We can't. I want to make this robot go three feet, but we can't tell it go three feet. The only thing we can tell it is time. How many seconds do I want it to roll for? And so, you know, the students figure out that they need to figure out, you know, what does three feet mean in seconds? Like, how do I figure that out? So we have them just play around with it. So what we have them do is come in and let's say we set it to 0.5 seconds and we hit start and it rolls for 0.5 seconds and they measure the distance and they, they, they write that down. And then, you know, we're trying to get them to do it multiple times. So this would be a great uh, exercise for even a middle school class of just distance formula and speed formula. Can you, you know, use the speed formula to calculate some distances? So they plug in those times. And once they plug in those times, change it to a different time, change it to one second, about two seconds, three seconds, so on and so forth. And so we want them to create a table. And so once we create a table, we can see that we've got times in seconds. So, you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 1, 1, 1. 1.5. And we've got those distances over here. And depending on what group you're in, you know, you could have them measure it in inches. Or, or, or maybe you could have them, if you're in a science class, you could have them measure it in centimeters. Or, or maybe have them do it in both. You know, see which one they like more and see which one's more accurate. Um, measure, tell them to measure it in one. And then later on, when you're doing the, the actual activity, give them all the distances in the opposite one. You know, force them to have to convert these numbers that they've created. You know, that's another way that this activity could be extended. But once we get this information, we can actually, we can do one of two things. 
Um, what we've done in the past is we've actually just had them use the speed formula to calculate the speed of the robot at these different you know points. So in this one, I've just got a quick, you know, we've had them do it by hand. Some groups I've had them use an actual uh, uh, Google Sheet document to do the calculation for them. So this is kind of also teaching them about Excel if you want to implement that. Um, and, and they get these speed calculations and we can kind of get an average speed. And we can see here that the average speed is about, you know, in inches, it's about 27 and a half inches per second. Um, you know, or we can do it in centimeters and we see it's about 70 inches per second. Um, another thing we can do is if you're in a math class that does regressions, you can take this data right here and you can actually copy it over into Desmos or whatever uh, device you're using for regressions. And we can enter this information into Desmos. And once we put it into Desmos, we can actually write the regression itself into Desmos. And we can, we can see the data. So the black dots here would be in inches and the red dots here would be in centimeters. And so we can write the regressions for those two things. So we got the regression for inches and we've got the regression for centimeters. And, and we can use that to get our information of, you know, how far do I need to, how long do I need to run this thing to get, you know, 10 feet or, or, or 11 feet or whatever that looks like. I um, mean, either way, we get similar values. You know, before we said that for the speed for inches was roughly 27, you know, inches per second. We said it for uh, centimeters, it was roughly 70. So we get similar information here. Um, so either one of those are, are perfectly valid ways that we've done so far to find the speed, but there, that's not the only two ways you could do it. Um, you could also use this information like in a calculus class and try to extend it and maybe collect information on the acceleration curve of this, because there is an acceleration curve. It's just hard to see. I didn't go to enough points to fully see it, um, but it does slowly accelerate over time and it is slightly curved. Um, so that's a possibility also. So we can get this information and, and, and go over here. And this is what we're trying to get them to get the first day or the second day if it's kind of a regular class. We want them to get this speed number. How fast does this robot go per second? How many inches does it go per second? How many centimeters does it go per second? Um, that's the goal of the first day um, or the second day. Also in, involved in this, once they get this number, we can play a game. So we try to do a game every day to try to keep them entertained and try to keep it competitive. So the first game that we can play is curling. Um, so literally like curling that they see in, in the Olympics. So we give, uh, we hand out the robot so that every pair has a robot. We split them up into two teams, you know, red team and blue team. They can change the color of their robot to match those colors. Um, and then, and we, we draw a curling board on the field, on the, on the, in the hallway. And, and it's, you know, some 20 feet away, draw the circles on the floor and we have them take turns going in one at a time. And, uh, we generally, for this, we have cranked the speed up a little bit just to keep it interesting because um, when these things plow into each other, they'll knock each other out of the way if you hit them with enough force. Um, and they get pretty competitive with it. And so we give them a distance and we say that the distance to the center of this thing is, you know, 30 feet away. Using your speed calculation, hit the target, hit that spot 30 feet away. And it's, it's impressive that they can figure that out using this data. And, you know, using this, I mean, we can say if we wanted to hit a distance of, you know, 30 feet, we could say that, so why is my distance? I want to go a distance of 30 feet times 12 gives me the inches. So if I wanted to go 30 feet with this robot, I can find the intersection. I'd have to tell the robot to go 13.235 seconds. So once they found that, you know, use, they could use the regression, they could use the equation, they could come back over here to the Sphero program and put that number right there. And theoretically, it would make the robot go 30 feet. Um, 30 feet is kind of a long distance. Uh, I wouldn't recommend going past 20 because once it gets to a certain length, uh, it starts getting off really bad. And the, the aim on it is a little off because there is a manual aim feature on this. Um, so that would be the first day and the second day. The next day, we're going to focus on the angle, the targeting. So what we do on this day is we put a mark in the center of the, uh, of the uh, floor and we just put marks around it, you know, that are equal distance away. And um, so maybe we did something like a, a two by one distance away. So you end up with a right triangle that has a two by one as its two legs. Um, and we tell the students that they have to use you either can tell them the distance, you can have them use distance formula to find the distance, you can have them use Pythagorean theorem to find the distance. Um, you could just have them use measure, rulers and measure physically how far away is the point from where you're starting. Um, but then the big thing for this day is 
you know, using that speed calculation they got the previous day to apply that into the formula um, and, and get the time so they can put the time into the, the uh, equation here, into the program here. And then they also need to use trig to find the angle. So this is, you know, where you're starting to get into your math two and your math three and math four information is, you know, can they use trig to find the angle that this rotation needs to go um, to get this point to hit this other point? Um, and and it's a it's a big thing because I mean even if you're off by a tiny tiny little bit it will make a big difference in the grand scheme of things if you don't aim it just right you know it really teaches them the attention to detail that is needed to make these things work and if you're off by even a small degree it makes a big difference in the long run um, there is some some wiggle room with some of these things we try to be uh, try to have some some grace when we're we're, we're marking it whether or not a, a, something hits a target or not. We usually give them a few inches and you know, we, we draw circles on the floor like you can see in the video. Um, and as long as they break the plane of the circle, uh, we usually give it to them. So you can be as lenient or strict as you want on it, um, but th they can be pretty accurate if the students are pretty accurate. Okay. And, and so that's what we do on the third day. So we've kind of scaffolded it. First day, you know, get the giggles out, get the troubleshooting out of the way. Second day, we're, we're really nailing down that speed value and we have to know that speed value before we leave day two. Day three, we really need to understand how we can use trig to get those angles and make those angles work. Um, and, and then on the fourth day and beyond, uh, however long you want to do this for, uh, this is where like the collimation of the project goes. So we're playing Battleship. So you can see from the, the images, um, we, we, we play Battleship. I mean, just like what we used to play when we were kids. And so we split the two... Uh, classes up into two groups. Uh, they get in pairs. Generally, they stay in the same pairs all, all week. And if you can help it, try to have them have the same robot all week. Um, it keeps the uh, speed calculations pretty accurate. Uh, most of the robots go about the same, but sometimes they're a little finicky. But um, sometimes it can't be helped to get the same one all the time. Sometimes the robots are tired and they just, they don't want to, they don't want to cooperate. But, um, you know, they, they get into these pairs and they split up into teams. And, and when they break up into teams, we, we, you know, give them some time to come up with team names. They want to spend, you know, three days just coming up with a team name. They've come up with everything from like Team America to just something as creative as Team One. Uh, you know, they, they, they come up with stuff. And then once they pick their names, we tell them, you know, hey, here are the ship sizes. You've got a two, two threes, a four and a five long ship on this floor. And we literally draw the map on the floor. Uh, I, I get down on a Sharpie and take a, about an hour you know, crawling around on the floor to try to draw uh, a, a battleship game on the floor using the one foot tiles. And uh, they pick where their ships go. And, you know, for an honors class, they can pretty much do this on their own. And they um, they can put the ships down and they know where they're at in their head and, and on their on their paper. And then they take turns just, you know, coming up, calling a shot. I'm aiming for a A1. And they fire and, and they, they try to hit it. Um, they do the calculations, you know, kind of ahead of time. And, and we do a couple of rounds of practice where, you know, you know, we help them through it, make sure their stuff's right so they don't get, you know, burnt out on it. But, um, you know, really honestly, with the, especially with honors classes, after, you know, one or two goes, you, most of your kids are going to be rolling through it. And, and they're going to be enjoying it. They're going to get really competitive. And they're going to be, you know, you're going to have a hard time keeping up with them because they're going to be ready to go. Uh, with a regular class or, or an, uh, uh, you know, an inclusion class or something along those lines, uh, you know, or maybe with a, a lower class than, than maybe juniors and seniors like we're dealing with in most of these classes. Um, what we did instead was we literally got them all together. We gathered around one board and then we put pieces of paper down on the floor that showed where the ships were at. This is literally what, you know, this ship is going right here. Um, and we just took turns as a group calculating how to hit, you know, how do I hit the corner of this ship right here? Um, and we, we did that for a day with one class and, and, and some, some of the groups in that, in that class, they never got off of that. That's what they did the whole time. And that was fine. They did that for two days and, th and then they finally cleared the board. They finally knocked all the ships off the board and they were ecstatic. Um, but the students that were able to, that we went to another board and we, we played a game there instead. Um, it really is like wide open the way you can do this. Um, and, and you can do it for as long as or short as you want. You can take as many pieces out of it as you want. Um, and, and this is just the beginning. I mean, really the things that can come from this, you know, you can really get into to rate conversions, you know, just simply make the robot roll for a certain distance and then calculate how far that was in inches and then make them calculate the same distance in, in centimeters or, or convert it into yards. Uh, you can really work through these, these equations of the distance formula 
the speed formula, the you know Pythagorean theorem, the the angle measure formulas for trig. It, it's really you know a lot of stuff there for that, um, and and you don't have to take it all the way to the battleship game. You can really just leave it at those those levels for like the middle school and the, and the, the ninth grade levels, or you can take it all the way up to the battleship game and beyond. Um, it, it really is a, a cool activity. It's a fun activity, and it's something that I enjoy doing. All right. So, um, just as this is just a, a recap of like the schedule that we used when we were doing this project, and this is just kind of a rough draft uh, idea of like what kind of we did. So, you know, day one, just recap. You know, divide the teams up, troubleshoot, uh, ex let the kids explore, collect data. Day two, we're really driving home that distance formula. However, we want to calculate that. We can, you know, in lower grades, maybe we just want them to measure the distance um, and, and go with that. And that's as much as we do. Maybe in middle school, we're going to use, you know, the speed formula. Maybe in high school, we can use Pythagorean theorem. Um, so there's tons of different options for that. And then we work into the curling activity. Um, and they really have a good time with that. Day three, we're focusing on our angle calculations. If you're dealing with uh, high school and you're, you're using um, uh, trig to find those values out, it is possible to aim the spheros and, and bypass this, but the aiming feature's a little finicky and, and um, students usually get frustrated with it. The, the angle uh, feature is much better. Um, and then we're playing the target practice game. And then the final day is when we work into the practice in the battleship. And, and you can differentiate that practice in that battleship as much as you want. Uh, you know, honors classes probably can jump right in, just do a couple of rounds and then roll with it. Uh, and then maybe in, in regular and inclusion settings, you're, you're going to focus on, you know, more group activity, more like collectively, here's where the ships are. You can see them on the, on the, on the board, um, see them on the floor and, and just uh, hit them. Can you hit them? So, you know, I know that was kind of fast and it's just, you know, a quick overview. And again, this is just one robotic tool with one activity with that robotic tool. Uh, there are tons of options out there. This is just hopefully to give you an idea of kind of what's what's possible. Uh, it, it's just a jumping off place. You know, don't take this as as just like this is the only thing you can do. Please take this and run with it. Design new activities, come up with new ideas. Uh, build off of this and, and, and please let me know the things that you come up with. If you have any questions, my email address is right there. Feel free to reach out to me and ask questions. I can provide some extra materials if you want to uh, use this lesson or maybe bounce some ideas off of. And also, uh, please fill out the bit.ly survey that's attached uh, right there. Um, it will uh, collect your information so that you can get your CEUs and all that and also pro provide some feedback for the uh, designers of this conference. Um, so that's, that's pretty much it. Let me know if you have questions.